Erev Tov, Chavri, I'm Stephen Benun. You're watching Danun Institute of Biblical Research, also Israeli News Live in the event we load this there. Not sure what I'm going to do as of yet. Very provocative message. It is thought-provoking, whatever you might call it. Does the Bible support an alien presence on the earth in modern times? I believe without, without a doubt it does. And it's probably going to shock you at just how this is all coming about. An alien presence, yes. But what is it? It is demonic. It is demons. But not just demons in human beings like in the case of uh, the maniac from Gadaria that the Bible speaks about that Yeshua cast the demons out of him. And then he realized he was naked and got dressed and was in his right mind. Not about uh, Mary Magdalene where he cast the seven devils out of. We're talking about actual devils. Nephilim, as we read in the Old uh, Testament there. Also the book of Enoch that speaks about this. Everywhere we find these type things. And the question is, are they existing in here on the earth today? I believe the answer is yes. And I believe it's laying in plain prophecy, plain sight. And we'll start with the very words of Yeshua himself, Jesus of Nazareth, here in the book of uh, Luke 17, starting with verse 26. And it was, well, just a second guys too, I got to make sure I keep my notes here with me. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them. Now, that might just seem simple to most people. Most people look at that and they say, okay, Jesus is saying that it's going to be the same way in this day here, the days of the coming of the Son of Man. That's the Son of Man is a prophet. Uh, the Son of Man, the, this is a future event. Maybe speaking about the coming of Eliyahu, Elijah, uh, could be speaking about Yeshua's return to the earth. But I know different people have different thoughts on that. I'm not here to kind of throw one way to the other on that. But the point is, is as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. Now notice what he says here. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Most people just simply say, well, they were gluttonous. Okay, I'll agree with that. If you go back and you look at though, uh, the book of Enoch clarifies it the best, but also we can find in the book of Genesis, Moses also clearly identifies what they ate, what they drank, and by the way, they were drinking blood all right, in case you didn't know it, they were eating, they were eating the animals, they were eating, eat, even eating human beings. That's just how demonic they had got. I'm not saying that God has not given a permissive will. We know in the Garden of Eden, uh, Adam and Eve, they were given of all the fruit of the trees to be able to eat. But as time went down, God gave permission of the eating of the animals. I personally don't do that myself. Uh, but just to share that thought with you. But they were eating not just the animals, they were eating the human beings as well and drinking their blood. And he says that action is going to repeat. Now the part about the marrying wives, well, it, you know, most people say, well, it was, it was promiscuous. It was, they was living in adultery. And no, sir, that's not what he's talking about. What kind of life were they living back then? This was the Nephilim, and they had come down, the fallen angels, and they, that's where the word Nephilim comes from too, by the way, fallen, it's the fallen ones. And they had came and they had married the women of that day. And don't think that these women were bad women either. If you ever really go and do the research on this and look at the ancient documents and some of uh, the other writings that we have about what happened there, at first they never could convince the women to, to marry them. They literally, from one account, and I forget which book this is actually written in, they took upon themselves, they transformed their bodies to look as if they were their husbands and they slept with them and had children by them. These women were deceived, my friends, into thinking they were real human beings. But they weren't. 
They found that out when they started birthing these children. I'm going to share something with you. I shared this on Paul, with Paul Begley the other day when I was on his channel. He asked me to come over to talk about North Korea to the people that he has there. And, um, you know, and, and let me just say this too. There, I know there's a lot of people that get all angry if I go to see Paul on his show or anything like that. And they say, well, you know, he's this or he's that. I'll tell you what. I will say this, my friends. I love you dearly. And every one of us has got different quirks, different issues. And some would say, well, he's a Jesuit. You know what? The two witnesses are going to come on this earth. And I may not have everything right in my doctrine either. But when they come on the earth, they're coming to set the story straight where we're messed up on these doctrines. I know a lot of people think, well, I'll be raptured out when the two witnesses get here. I don't think you will be. I do believe in a rapture. And people say, what do you believe in pre-trip, post-trip, mid-trip, whatever? You know, God says it clearly in Zephaniah that he will hide the who, the meek of the earth right before his wrath. Okay, just to share that with you. It is, it is a biblical fact. There is a rapture. Zephaniah clarifies that as well. And it's written in the New Testament. We know that. But Zephaniah says, God hides you before his wrath. And he says, pray that, the, that you may be found worthy to be hidden. Okay, so my point is, I believe that the church sees the two witnesses as well. Why do you think the scripture says 10 people of the nations take hold of the skirt of a Jew and say, show us your ways. We hear God is with you. Well, what wakes up Israel? The two witnesses. So who recognizes? You see, they come to help get the church ready to go. Why? Because she's not ready. Who, who, what doctrine are we going to base the, the truth of the, God's Word on so we can say that this church has it right or that church, the Baptists, the Methodists, the Presbyterian, the Pentecostals. No, I'm sorry, what about the, uh, the, 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 the Hebrew Roots Movement? Or what about the Messianic Group? Or what about, you know, and, and let me tell you something. That shows right there, Messianic Group, and I love you, my brothers, but we don't, you don't have it right can't not don't say you don't have a lot of things right i appreciate the fact that we go back to the feast and the keeping of the feast sure i appreciate that keeping of the sabbath i appreciate that as well all right but if you had it right then then why do they say in there the ten people of the nations they say to the jews not to the messianic group we hear god is with you show us your ways that ain't 613 commandments out of levitical law either friends because there's many messianic groups that try to keep all of this. So that something's wrong. All right? So those witnesses are going to help wake up both. And we're going to need it. When you hear about what I'm about to share with you, we're going to need it. All right? So here's what was going on. They were eating and drinking. And these Nephilim, these fallen angels, had taken on human bodies to look like their husbands. And these women fell for it. Kind of makes you wonder if Nephilim aren't some of the ministers in the pulpits today seducing the churches to believe a lie. I wouldn't doubt it a bit in the world. And doing what? Producing giants. Producing mega churches and everything else. They're producing all right, but it's not the children of Almighty God. But it's going to be more than just a spiritual thing as well. Because that's what Yeshua says here. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered in the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. So we know, speaking of a future date as well, that destruction has to come. All right, now, I want to show you something though. And there's so many scriptures I would have loved to have had in here, but I just did not have the time to put them all together. Now, I'm going to show you something here, and this is in Exodus chapter 34. I'm just I'm going to start at verse 9, but we're going to, uh, actually, not, I'm sorry, we're going to start at verse 16. We'll come back to verse 9 in just a moment here. Now, here's what's interesting. It says here in verse 16 of Exodus 34, let me start verse 15. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they go astray after their gods and do sacrifice unto their gods, and they call thee, and thou eat of their sacrifice, and thou take of their daughters unto thy sons, and thy daughters go astray after their gods, and make thy sons go astray after their gods. Thou shalt make thee no molten gods. 
okay now just showing you here again this was the prophecy that was given to Moses and the prophecy is speaking about how things get all twisted up and how you end up marrying in amongst these others and you end up serving other gods now, this was a warning to Israel and a lot of people think, well, this is just an old prophecy. This is something that happened many years ago. Well, that's what I'm about to share with you in Exodus 34. Uh, we go back up to verse 9 here, and you're about to find out this is a prophecy that never has been fulfilled and is a future prophecy yet to be fulfilled. And yet there are aspects of it that have been fulfilled. Let me show you this. And he said, If now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, this is Moses speaking unto God, let the Lord, I pray you, go in the midst of us, where it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for thine inheritance. You know, Israel never made it that far. They never made it even back then. God was so angry with them. They stayed in that wilderness for 40 years. And even then Moses was prophesying that they'd be cast out of the very land that he was sending them to as a promised land. You know, by the way, that promised land necessarily is not necessarily the physical land of Israel. Like I shared with you the other day, the re revelation Sister Jennifer shared with me over there in uh, Genesis chapter 1. We're that land. All right? But anyway... But he speaks about, he asked God to pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us for thine inheritance. Do you realize he is actually speaking of Daniel's prophecy? And Daniel hadn't even been born yet, but Daniel's going to prophesy the same thing. And, and the 70 weeks are decreed upon thy people, Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sin, and to forgive iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and profit, and to anoint the most holy place. The most holy place is your heart. It's not a physical temple, but that's what they're going to build, and that's what you're going to get back into in just a minute here in Exodus. Now you said, Steve, what about aliens and stuff? You're going to find that out. Bear with me. All right. So 70 weeks are decreed upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin and to forgive iniquity. Well, see, this is what Moses is asking right there. It's a stiff necked people and pardon our iniquity and our sin. Daniel says what? To forgive iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and the prophet, to make an end of sin. And Moses is asking exactly for that. And Daniel's saying that it is a still for a future date. And it's part of the 70 weeks of Daniel. And it still hasn't happened. Yes, Mashiach came. He was cut off, not for himself. He's cut off for our sake. Right? This is why he was hung on the tree. This is why his side was pierced to release the life that was inside of Jesus, Yeshua, inside that body, his life, that life of Almighty God was in him and it was released to come back upon us, the children of God, to fill us with the Holy Spirit. Okay? This is that Easter message, the Passover message that I wanted to bring to you. No, I don't go in for the Easter bunnies and things like that. I mean, if you do, I, it's up to you. I'm just, you know, I say that word Easter and a lot of people take offense to that. So, I, you know, I only say it to make the point of the time for those that think of it in that terms. All right, now, but it's a stiff neck people. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Let's, let's jump over here. Got to get this cursor to move. Sometimes this computer wants to freeze up. And he said, Behold, I make a covenant before all thy people. I will do marvels. And that word, by the way, in Hebrew is not marvels. Nephalot is wonders. I'm talking miracles. I'm going to create. See? He's going to create. He's going to say or to do or to make. Actually, I apologize. That's the, to, to, to make. There is a word here, the bra, that we're going to get into in a minute that is actually create. He's going to talk about what he's going to do with him. Osei, Osei Nifolot. I'm going to do great marvels or wonders. Okay, Nifolot. Such as have not been wrought in all the earth, nor in any nation, and all people among which 
you are shall see the work of the Lord that I am about to do with you that is tremendous. Interesting, isn't it? They're going to see the work I'm about to do with you. And it's tremendous. Now, the reason why they change this to marvels instead of wonders, the correct translations, the rabbis have actually admitted why they chose to change it to the word marvels. They say because Moses died and he did nothing greater than the parting of the Red Sea. And here we are in Exodus 34, long into the wilderness journey, and Moses hasn't done anything greater. And second of all, it's almost as if God is schizophrenic here, which I know God's not. I say this to make a point here. God's already said, you're not going into the land because he smoked the rock. He did it in anger. Or even less, uh, you know, I forget the actual timeline. Maybe he hasn't smitten the rock yet. But the point is, God knows everything. He knows the end from the beginning, everything. He knew Moses was never going into that promised land. But he says here, behold, I make a covenant before all your people. I will do marvels such as not has been wrought in all the earth, nor in any nation. And all the people among which you are shall see the work of the Lord that I'm about to do with you, that it is tremendous. So one, Moses never fulfilled the prophecy. And second, he's talking about the land that he's going to go to. Hmm. He's fixing to get into that, I should say. The promised land of Israel. So God prophesies that Moses is going to do wonders like he's never done before with him. And that he's also going to go to the promised land. He says, observe you that which I am commanding you this day. Behold, I, will drive, I am driving out before you the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. All right, now, in case you guys don't know Hebrew right here, observe thou that which I am commanding thee this day. Shamar lecha. That is a masculine singular word right there. That is to Moses directly, not to all of Israel, to Moses. Okay? Shamar lecha et ashar onochi matzoch. Hayom. He said, I'm commanding you this day. Behold, I am driving out before you the Amorite, the Canaanite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Hineni Goresh Miganecha. Again, Moses has got to be there. It is in a, it's possessive to him. This is to Moses alone. He's speaking about this. And God is talking about driving out the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Hittite, and the Perizzite. Let me tell you something about the... I mean, you're going to learn this in just a moment. All right, The Canaanite and the Perizzite happen to be Nephilim. They are the giants. They are the fallen ones, descendants of them. Now, I'm going to tell you something, friends. There's been people trying to figure this out all along. How did the giants get over here when God killed all of them during the Andalusian destruction? Noah comes over, Ham, Sham, and Japheth. There's only three people. They repopulate the earth. And then suddenly we have these Nephilim all over again. And Joshua is faced with them. Moses is faced with them. They're all faced with them. And now God's prophesying about something Moses is going to do in the future. And he's saying that these guys are going to be there as well. I thought they got driven out by Joshua. Well, Joshua does during that day. But you're going to find out something interesting. There's no genealogies for the ones that came in during the days of Joshua. I'll bring that point out in just a moment here. All right? So, this has not been fulfilled yet. This does happen during the time of Joshua, right? Take heed to yourself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, whether you go, where, where you're going to, lest they be for a snare in the midst of thee. Now, God is still speaking everything that Moses himself is going. It's all there. Lecha, 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 lecha. All right? Leyashulcha arts. <laughs> wow. Very interesting. Pen Barit 
Take heed to the step, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land whither thou goest. Ashata asha ata bo alea. Alea. So Moses is going to that land, and yet God swore that he couldn't go there because of what he did during that life. All right? So Moses is actually going. It's prophecy that has never been fulfilled yet. And God's going to do the great wonders with him, part of the two witnesses. He's going to need those wonders, friends, because he's up against a very powerful force on this earth. Now, but I think before I go any further, I'm going to share something with you. I have heard, I shared this on Paul Begley's program the other day. I meant to tell you this a moment ago and I forgot. I got sidetracked with people that don't like Paul Begley. And I shared with him something I've been wanting to share with you guys. I don't very often ever speak of supernatural things that happen. I don't speak about dreams, visions. I don't speak about miracles. Uh, there's some that I've shared with you guys over the years. Uh, my mother being blind and receiving her sight when I prayed for. There's been other, many, many others that have happened in life. Um, you know, I've seen the angel of the Lord on several occasions. I don't think I've ever spoke about that before. And I'm not going to go into that uh, and, and I'm not talking about just dreaming things. I'm talking about realities. And, but I've also, recently, I had two visions. And I felt like that I should share these with you. Mainly because of this. And what I'm going to share with you uh, was very, very powerful that happened. And at the same token, you have to understand, I've heard things about what they call the... Um, shapeshifters or the reptilians that are here and I've heard about you know just bits and pieces here and there where Diana uh, supposedly uh, her husband was a reptilian the whole uh, the whole clan there uh, of the royalty of England supposedly are reptilians I'll just say allegedly and I would hear these things and I didn't really know what to think about it I didn't think no and I didn't think yes about it and there's been so many other things that you know that you hear from time to time, and I never speak about those things, and uh, and so what I did is I uh, just always kind of you know just okay that's kind of interesting you know and but don't but don't give it much weight and and I realize that there's people out there like L.A. Marzuli and uh, uh, also uh, Steve um, uh, I can't think of Steve's last name right now. But, uh, you know, many others out there that speak about the conspiracies and things that are going on, etc. And many more out there. I found this out because of after the visions I'm about to share with you. Uh, my wife began to share with me some things and play them for me. We were traveling back from Austria that blew me away. But in the vision, I don't know why I've see it, seen it. And I don't really know the fullness about this. But in this vision, the first one that I had was of a reptilian. He looked like a man, but he looked like the most hideous sight of a man you could ever possibly imagine. I don't know how I knew this, but these people are involved in governments. Uh, they're involved in high offices. On this one particular guy, it was almost like looking at a demon, but he had the ability to look like a human being as well, changing his form completely much like what I shared with you earlier about what happened in the times of Noah. They, as I said, there is an apocryphal work, or Gnostic, I don't remember which one it is, but they, they actually write in there that they could not convince these women to go with them in the beginning. But what they did later on a second attempt was they transformed themselves to look like their husbands, and they believed it, and they slept with these men and had children by them. And that's what brought the Nephilim into being. Well, I've seen this in vision that this happens. But then in the second vision, I saw a more horrible and horrendous thing as well. And again, this was in very elite circles that I saw this happening in. But there had been a child that was taken. And that child 
was given over to one group and that group gave it over to these reptilians as they some call them shapeshifters and I remember when that child was sent into that room I knew that the child was given for them to devour and I, I came out of the vision and I was blown away what I had just seen I didn't actually have to witness what happened but I knew what was being done. I say this because then my wife, of course, she's done so much research in so many areas. She's aware of a lot of these things that have been said. Steve Quayle, that's who I was thinking of a moment ago. And I know Steve has shared our, our broadcast on his channel from time to time, and I really appreciate that. My wife actually had spoken to Steve years ago when he first started his work there, and he wanted to connect uh, years ago with us as well. We just never had that opportunity to, to work it out. But she began to play some videos for me. And of course, I found out real quick, like it is the reptilians being to believed to be these aliens that are on this earth here, or demons is the better way. It is part of the fallen angels um, that devour human beings. And there was a former government person, a whistleblower. I know I listened to one man that was a former defense minister for Canada speak about things and then there was another elderly man as well and I forget who he was but he he did not want to go there but he admitted to the lady that was interviewing him that it is true they devour children not just children but full-grown human beings and animals as well again like it says as it was in the days of Noah so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man these things will repeat again on this earth so we know the prophecy is there, and I saw it, and I saw it in the vision, and I know it's coming. I've seen others that I've shared with you recently, two different people that had visions of this type of thing going to happen on the earth. And so it's made me do some research, but I didn't research nothing as I began to do when I had the visions. And the thing is, I realize that we may be faced with these types of entities but we are actually more powerful than they are. You may not realize that. And it's not that the power is there yet. We need to wake up to who we are. And I'm going to share some of that with you. Because you got to remember, as I was listening to some of this research, one of these soldiers that actually, I listened to a message of a soldier that seen, seen these type people, and they spoke about how that they actually work with them. Some, and they spoke about all the different types of races there are of these demons that come from different planets and things like that. Well, no doubt that's, that's how they got back on the earth again. The earth destroyed the children of the Nephilim, but remember, and of course those Nephilim were put into prisons and stuff. It's not the only, remember, that was only like 200 fallen angels that came down to the earth to begin with, I think according to the book of Enoch. There was, was two-thirds of the angels of heaven came down uh, on the, that were cast out. So where are they living? They're waiting for judgment. All right, so let's just think of those type things there. So we're, we're dealing with a very demonic situation on this earth today and was back then as well. So this is what I'm looking at. And the thing is, is God has made us, we have the ability, it's within you, it's in your DNA. The thing is, is something needs to wake you up. And I'm going to do that in part two of this message that I'll be doing. It's a lot of more research that I'm going to go down and share with you. All right. But there is the ability in us because like Samson, he could take down a thousand men. Look at Joshua's men fighting these giants in the land there. They had the ability to take down giants even though they would look like grasshoppers next to them. Now I've been told that according to what uh, they write in there about, uh, or what this one guy spoke about that was a whistleblower, military whistleblower that seen them, he said they had the strength of about 15 men, one of them. And their speed is so fast, it is unbelievable. He said there, you just, there's no challenge to them. But did anybody forget? Samson could take down a thousand. Did anybody forget that it's also written, I know it's in the book of Jasher, but I think it's also in our own canon of our Bible, that one son of Jacob, the children of Jacob, have such an amazing gift of superhuman strength. Different gifts. Judah had it. Manasseh had it, according to the book of Jasher. 
I think in our canon it says that one of the children of Israel, one man could put the flight a hundred. And two of them could put the flight a thousand. Or it could be maybe as a thousand and then ten thousand they could put the flight two. In the book of Jasher it does say like that. A thousand and ten thousand. We're much greater than they are. When the Spirit of God is upon us. But I believe there's something that we still have a need of. And I believe the two witnesses will wake that up in us to get us ready for the battle we're about to face. Let's continue on. We're just getting started. So he says, Take heed to thyself, lest I make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, whither thou goest, lest they be a snare in the midst of you. See? But you shall break down their altars, and dash in pieces their pillars, and you shall cut down their asherim. For thou shalt bow down to no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. See, they, they make themselves God on earth. What do you think the pharaohs were? It's a possibility. Let's move on. We already spoke about Daniel 9. Let's go into Genesis now. All right. We're in Genesis 6. And I bring you Genesis 6 up because what I want to share with you here um, is we go into who the Nephilim actually married. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for that also is that he also is flesh, therefore shall his days be 120 years. It's not talking about that he is only going to live to be 120 years old. Some people get that mixed up because Abraham lived to be 170 years old. Uh, it was actually 120 years before the flood came. The Nephilim were in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, they bore children to them, and the same were mighty men that were of old, the, the men of renown. By the way, in the King James Version, the Nephilim, they always translate that as giants, okay? The fallen ones, right? All right, so we get there. Now let's go over to the book of Numbers. This is going to bring back some memories right here uh, when we look in the book of Numbers. But I'm going to start off with one part right here. And then we're going to back up just a little bit. And they went into the south and came into Hebron. Okay. Ahimon, Shishai, and Talamai, the children of Anak, were there. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. By the way, Zoan, that's also where Moses did the miracles. And it's also where those pharaohs of Egypt and their priests did their things as well, was in Zoan. All right. Now, Anak, he's from the people of Anakai. You know how they talk about the Anunnaki? Those of you that follow these things about aliens and giants and stuff on the earth, Anunnaki, well, that's where Anak, he's part of that. Now his sons, Shishai, Talmi, and the children, uh, and excuse me, and, and uh, Ahamin, Ahaman, they were literally dwelling there inside of um, inside of uh, uh, in, in the mountains there around Jerusalem and places like that. All right. Now let's back up though. Let's let's move, let's go up a little bit higher. Numbers thirteen, chapter thirteen. This is where the the Ten spies are sent to spy out the land. All right. Now, Moses speaks about all the different ones, one man from each tribe that came in there. All right. Joshua was one of those men. He was the son of Nun. He was from the tribe of Ephraim, Hoshea, the son of Nun. All right. That's where I get my last name from, uh, Joshua, son of Nun. And, uh, of course, Caleb also. I think Caleb is, uh, is from the tribe of Judah, if I remember right. Let's just look real quick. Um, okay, Caleb, here we go. The son, okay, yeah, that's right, tri the tribe of Judah. All right, so he goes and he's the one. It was Caleb that drove the, the Anak out of that city there, his sons, not Anak. Anak was not there. Now, to save time, let me just tell you real quick about Anak. Anak, if you look it up biblically on a genealogy basis, all you can find is Anak's father. No other trace anywhere back. And of course, it's also referred to them as the Nephilim, the giants. Enoch is. All right. Now, let's take a look, though, what happens when the two spies or the ten spies go down. Moses called Hoshea the son of Nun Joshua, and Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said unto them, Get you up here into the south and go up into the mountains and see the land, what it is, and the people that dwelt therein, uh, whether they are strong or weak. 
whether they are few or many. And when the land uh, is that they dwell in, whether it is a good or bad, and what cities they are, are that they dwell in, whether uh, in camps or in strongholds, and what the land is, whether it is fat or lean, whether there is wood therein or not, or, or if you be of you of good courage and bring the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. So they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin and to Rehob and to the entrance of Hamath. And they went up into the south and came into Hebron and to Himon. And Shishai and Tommy, the children of Anak, were there. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in the Egypt. And they came unto the valley of Eshkol and cut down from thence a branch with with a one cluster with one cluster of grapes, they bore it upon a pole between two. They took also the pomegranates of the figs. That it took two men to carry a cluster of grapes. I don't know if you know this, guys. If you've ever visited Israel, have you ever seen the figs there? They're like that. Like that. They're huge. Not like American figs, little tiny little round things like that. Even European figs, a little bit bigger than American figs, but in Israel, they're huge. You know why? Gold. The gold, remember how it speaks in the Bible in Genesis about the land, uh, the gold of that land is good. Job speaks about it. It comes out like the dust of the ground. Anytime there is gold in the earth, see, this is what God really meant for you to do with gold. Gold is not meant for you to be digging it up all out of the earth and making all kinds of gods and painting your house full of gold. The gold is meant to enrich the earth so that the food that we partake of also helps our physical bodies as well. Now, I know that there is a such thing as colloidal gold, uh, there is monoatomic gold, and but you don't have even need of that. What you have need of is that your food comes from a land that is enriched with gold. And it just so happens, Egypt is the same, by the way. The, the type of rock in that land that they have is so enriched with gold. So the soil itself, limestone that is, the soil itself as well is enriched with gold. And the grapes, it's proven fact, if the ground is enriched with gold, the food and the flowers and everything else grows much bigger and much more uh, better than any other type. Because it's just something about the gold itself. When the plant absorbs that gold, it, it breaks down the, the, it actually breaks it into a monoatomic inside the plant. And it happens to be that red grapes are full of gold. And that is what helps your physical body. It even, I think it has a lot to do with the fact of uh, longevity, and I know that there are scientists that believe that as well. I say that because if you ever notice what Moses did, they make the golden calf, Moses beats it down, turns it into powder, and throws it into the water, and tells them to drink the water. They wash their clothes. The Bible says their shoes nor their clothes didn't wear out for 40 years. Not only that, I've always said they didn't age either. People differ with me on that. But if you ever look at it, the, this, the, there's an account by Joshua and there's an account by Moses. He said his strength did not abate for 40 years while he was in that wilderness journey. Joshua carries the same testimony. So there's something that it does. It helps our body. And therefore, it is, it is in fact, no matter where you grow plants and things, every plant, because there, there's gold is always there in the ground in different places. It just happens to be more abundant in certain places, and you can always tell by the way the crops grow. All right, that's just a thought there for you, you know, so your diet helps you as well. But anyway, so they had those clusters, and they returned from spying out the land in the end of 40 days, and they went and came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel and to the wilderness of Paran, to the Kadesh, and brought back word unto them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We came into the land whither thou sent us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Howbeit the people that dwell in the land are fierce, and the cities are fortified, and they're very great, and moreover we saw the children of Anak there. All right, so see, notice, Anak was dwelling amongst them. Now watch what verse 29 says, Amalek dwelleth in the land of the south, and the, and the Hittite, and the Jebusite, and the Amorite dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanite dwell by the sea, along by the side of the Jordan. Well, what do you know? Amalek. You know who Amalek is? Amalek just so happens to be Esau's grandson. 
by Esau's son's concubine. Isn't that interesting? That Anak is living in the same land that Esau is. And today, the Roman Catholic Church, the Pope talks about willing to baptize aliens. No wonder it runs in the family bloodline to live together. I mean, I'm blown away by this. And the Canaanites also, by the way, happen to be part of the Nephilim. And I don't remember if I put all the scriptures in there, the references here for you so you would know this, but that's, I've actually I've traced everything down just so that you would actually be able to know this. Now, uh, so you go on down, and he dwelleth by the sea and along in the side of the Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people and toward Moses and said, We should go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We are not able to go against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they spread an evil report of the land which they had spied out unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have passed by to spy it out, and the land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that, that, that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there, were, there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come of the Nephilim, and see, they come of the Nephilim, They're literally from the, from the Nephilim. They didn't just, this had nothing, they didn't come from the flood. They didn't come over the ark with Ham, Sham, or Japheth. The Nephilim brought them back. Those fallen devils keep bringing in more. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, so we were in their sight. All right, now, Joshua 15, we can see this. And Caleb drove out thence the, the three sons of Anak, Shishai, Ahaman, and Talamai, the children of Anak, and went up thence against the inhabitants of Debir. Now the name of Debir before time was Kerath Sefer. And Caleb said, He that smiteth Kerath Sefer and taketh it to him will I give Akash, my daughter, to wife. So they were defeating, and somehow or another, God gave the children of Israel the ability to overcome these giants, these Anunnaki. But you notice there was only two. Joshua and Caleb were the only two that had that gift. If you've ever read the book of Jasher, and you realize and you read over there the story of Joseph in the book of Jasher, go read that. This is where you find out that the sons of Jacob were given a special gift of supernatural strength. And we got it right here in our own Bible. These men are like grasshoppers, but yet Caleb and Joshua, their faith and their God gave them the ability to overcome these men. And even in the book of Jasha, we find out that when they doubt, they lose their strength. Isn't that interesting? If thou canst believe, all things are possible to what? To them that believe. Book of Jasher, we find out Judah, he was a very strong believer, Judah was, and he had the strength that was unimaginable. Judah said, he said, I'll kill every Egyptian in this city by myself tonight. You need to read that story. Amazing the exploits they did. And when Manasseh could steal Judah's temper, what did Judah say to his brethren? Because he didn't know that this was Joseph's brother at first. He says, this is not an Egyptian. This is a child of my father, Jacob. And they, they reveal in there that that gift began with Jacob's children. I believe Abraham as well. All right, now, so we look into this. We see that as well. Now, let's move over to Deuteronomy. All right, again, we see that in 3.11, uh, actually, we'll start at verse 10. All the cities of the plain and all the Gilead and Bashan and Tesalak and Adari, cities of the kingdom of Og and Bashan. For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of the of Rephaim. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. It is not, a, 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 not in Reba of the children of Ammon. Nine cubits was the length thereof and four cubits the breadth of it and after the cubit of a man. So the king of Og was a giant as well but from a different race. And that's what's interesting. That's what they talk about on some of these videos here. There's so many different races of these, 
beings here in different sizes as well. And that's what we find out reading here in these prophecies as well. Now, I'm blown away by these things, but in closing, I want to share two things with you here. We're going to look at Revelations 11, but we're also going to look at another one here. This is the Apocalypse of Thomas. It's not part of our own canon. And I realize that when you look at books like this, you really need to be cautious because there are some out there that are not true, that appear true. There's some that are true. And of course, they may be twisted in the way they've been translated and written and things of that nature there. I, I can't say for sure. What I do look at when I'm reading any of these books here, I look especially of something that it'd be in line with what Amos says in chapter 3. If there's one spiritual among you or a prophet, I, the Lord, will make myself known to them in dreams and in visions. And if what they say comes to pass, then fear them. You know, in other words, have a respect because God is with them. Now, I look at this, like in this particular case here, from a prophetic stance that what is being said here is things that have actually already begun to transpire. And I wanted to share that with you. I don't know about verses or anything like this in here. You can look it up online called the Apocalypse of Thomas. But watch what it says here. And after that, again, a king shall arise in the south part of the world and shall hold rule a little space in whose days the treasuries shall fail because of the wages of the Roman soldiers, so that the substance of all the age shall be commanded or to be taken and given to the king to, to, distribu to distribute or redistribute. Isn't it interesting that Pope Francis, and I don't say this is the Pope of Rome, but I just think it's interesting that he happened to come from the south, from South America. And he is ruling as a king over the Vatican. Now, I don't say he's the king of the south. I believe he's the king of the north. But he's ruling in the north or north of Israel. And he has stated one of the very same things. That they should take up all the money of the world, of all the rich people, and they should redistribute it amongst the poor. They should have things in common. Well, what's interesting is supposed to be during his time that treasuries are going to fail. And isn't it interesting that it says because of the Roman soldiers? All this money that the Vatican is spending on the NATO forces, the United Nations plans, the whole ideology. Now, they don't say that the United Nations is the one that has sent the United States in to overthrow Iraq and Libya and Egypt and all of these countries here. But just so you know, even Ethiopia, where the Bible says in Daniel 11 that Ethiopia would be at his steps, it's the Vatican's own banks that they work with and support that are causing the overthrow of the Ethiopian people today. And it is the NATO forces whom he is also the the founding father of the European Union and the creation of the United Nations greatly behind the Vatican and of course NATO forces as well. So according to uh, the Apocalypse of Thomas, Thomas says these are Roman soldiers. For the British Empire, the United States also being a part of that, which is under Rome, because they made a covenant before World War I, and they began to take over everything. I go into this many times on Israeli News Live. You can look that up there if you would like. Therefore shall be plenty of corn and wine and oil, but great dearness of money, so that the substance of gold and silver shall be given for coin, and there shall be a great dearth. Everybody now trying to gather up gold of the earth in order, in order to be able to buy food when the money fails. Everybody's expecting it. Everybody's calling for it. Well, he's saying that's, that's still prophetic as far as that goes. Uh, I don't have the silver or gold. I actually had a sister that sent me a, a little coin one day. I had no idea that the, the little coin was made out of gold, and I think it was supposed to be like worth $200 or something. I just thought she did it because I like to collect old uh, coins from other countries, and it was from Switzerland. Uh, so I'm glad I didn't lose the thing, but, uh, but other than that, no, I've never bought gold or silver or any of those things. Um, so anyway, it says, At that time shall be very great rising of the sea, so that no man shall tell news to any man. That could come from tidal waves. 
and it could become because Russia sets off a nuclear bomb on the ocean floor. And I've seen one Russian politician claim that they did this to Japan that caused the Fukushima disaster when he was drunk on television. So think about it. The kings of the earth and the princes and the captains shall be troubled and no man shall speak freely. Gray hair shall be seen upon boys and the young shall not give place unto the aged. Well, they're fixing to stop freedom of speech. I see that coming as well. After that shall arise another king, a crafty man, who shall hold rule for a short space, in whose days there shall be all manner of evils, even the death of the race of men from the east, even unto Babylon. That's what they're doing, isn't it? From the east, now they're talking about doing a great war over there to make away all the North Koreans. All the way to Babylon. And thereafter, death and famine of men from east even into Babylon. After that, uh, excuse me, a sword in the land of Hanan even unto Rome. Well, all the way to Babylon, the ancient city of Babylon in Syria. They're just about trying to, they're, they're, and they're not done yet, friends. That's the bad thing. They're going to keep doing it, annihilating the entire races of people. It's terrible. Then shall all the fountains of the waters of the wells boil over and turn into blood. The heavens shall be moved, the stars shall fall upon the earth, the sun shall be cut in half like the moon, and the moon shall not give her light. There shall be great signs and wonders in those days when Antichrist draweth near. These are the signs and wonders in those days when the Antichrist draweth near. These are the signs unto them that dwell on the earth. In those days the pains of great travail shall come upon them. The Antichrist now draweth near. These are the signs. Woe unto them that dwell on the earth, and those great pains of travail shall come upon them. Woe unto them that build, for they shall not inhabit. We'll go any further than that on it. The Pope has talked about baptizing aliens. And he says, yes, I, you know, the little green men that children draw. What do they know that we don't know? That's demons, by the way. But I do remember the famous prophecy in Revelation 11, and I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three square days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees, the two candlesticks, standing before the God of earth, the earth, that's written over in Zechariah. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth, and devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over the waters to turn them to blood. Just like Thomas wrote, isn't it? Friends, we're coming to a very serious hour. So does the Bible speak that we will be dealing with that similar to the times of Noah? Well, Yeshua said, yes, we will. They were eating and drinking and given in marriage. These aliens have been known to eat human beings, as I saw in the vision myself, and drink blood. They've also known to mutilate animals as well. Do the same thing to the animals. And the thing is, he said they were given and given in marriage. Well, that's what they did in Noah's day. They, they turned themselves, make themselves look like women's husbands and had children by them. They were also living amongst the uh, Edomites in modern day Israel and amongst other groups of races there, living in amongst them and marrying among them. No wonder why God told Moses in Exodus 34, don't make no covenants with them. Why? Because he says your sons will marry their, their daughters and their daughters will marry your sons. Just like it was in the days of Noah. And in today, no doubt, as we saw with Princess Diana, if it's really true that she was in a family of reptilians, then what was she giving birth to? Just like it was in the days of Noah. I think we're living in a very serious hour, friends. Very serious. I think we need to really get on our face before God and seek God to know what we need to do to be ready for this hour. We need to believe. We need to have the faith the way the children, the sons of Jacob had faith. The way that Samson had faith. We need to get ready. And then we need to get out of this world. I'm Stephen Benin, you're watching the Institute of Biblical Research. Here at the time.